offer the idea that in more modern terms, what is meant that some of us will travel laterally to that better world and some will not, they will remain stuck along the lateral axis, which means that for them the kingdom did not come, not in their alternative world. And yet, meantime, it did come in ours. So it comes, and yet it does not come. Amazing. If you have followed my conjectures about the overlapping of these alternate worlds, and you sense as I do the possibility that if there are three or four or two, there may be 30 or 3,000 of them, and that some of us live in this one, others of us in another one, others in others, and that events on one track cannot be perceived by persons not in that track. Well, let me say what I want to say and be done with it. I think I once experienced a track in which the Savior returned, but I experienced it just briefly. I am not there now. I am not sure I ever was. Certainly I may never be again. I grieve for that loss, but loss it is. Somehow I moved laterally, but then fell back, and then it was gone. A vanished mountain and a stream, the sound of bells, and all gone now for me, entirely gone. I, in my stories and novels, often write about counterfeit worlds, semi-real worlds, as well as deranged private worlds, inhabited often by just one person, while meantime the other characters either remain in their own worlds throughout or are somehow drawn into one of the peculiar ones. This theme occurs in the corpus of my 27 years of writing. At no time did I have a theoretical or conscious explanation for my preoccupation with these pluriform pseudo-worlds, but now I think I understand. What I was sensing was the manifold of partially actualized reality lying tangent to what evidently is the most actualized one, the one which the majority of us by consensus gentium agree on. Although originally I presumed that the differences between these worlds was caused entirely by the subjectivity of the various human viewpoints, it did not take me long to open the question as to whether it might not be more than that, that in fact plural realities did exist superimposed onto one another like so many film transparencies. What I still do not grasp, however, is how one reality out of the many becomes actualized in contradistinction to the others. Perhaps none does, or perhaps, again, it hangs on an agreement in viewpoint by a sufficiency of people. More likely, the matrix world, the one with the true core of being, is determined by the programmer. He or it articulates, prints out, so to speak, the matrix choice and fuses it with actual substance. The core or essence of reality, that which receives or attains it, and to what degree, that is within the purview of the programmer. This selection and reselection is part of general creativity, of world building, which seems to be it or his task. A problem, perhaps, which he or it is running, which is to say, in the process of solving, as a computer would. Variables along the linear time axis of our universe thereby generating branched off lateral worlds. I have the impression that the metaphor of the chessboard is especially useful in evaluating how this can be done. In fact, must be. Across from the programmer reprogrammer sits a counter entity whom Joseph Campbell calls the dark counter player. God, the programmer reprogrammer, is not making his moves of improvement against inert matter. He is dealing with a cunning opponent. Let us say that on the game board, our universe in space-time, the dark counterplayer makes a move. He sets up a reality situation of immutable cause and effect. But the programmer, reprogrammer, has already laid down his response. It has already happened, these moves on his part. The printout, which we undergo as historic events, passes through stages of a dialectical interaction, thesis and antithesis, as the forces of the two players mingle. Evidently, some syntheses fall to the dark counterplayer, and yet they do not, by virtue of the fact that in advance, our great advocate selected variables 
the alternation of which brings final victory to him. In winning each sequence in turn, he claims some of us, we who participate in the sequence. This is why instinctively people pray, libera me domine, which decodes to mean extricate me, programmer, as you achieve one victory after another. Include me in that triumph. Move me along the lateral axis so that I am not left out. If a sense as being left out means not, nothing other than remaining under the jurisdiction of or falling prey to the malignant power. But that malignant power for all its guile has already lost even as it wins. For in some way the counterplayer is blind and so the programmer reprogrammer possesses an advantage. I submit to you that such alterations, the creation or selection of such so-called alternative presence is continually taking place. The very fact that we can conceptually deal with this notion that is entertained as an idea is the first step in discerning such processes themselves. But I doubt if we will ever be able in any real fashion to demonstrate to scientifically prove that such lateral change processes do occur. Probably all we would have to go on would be vestiges of memory, fleeting impressions, dreams, nebulous intuitions that somehow things had been different in some way. And not, and not long ago, but now, we might reflexively reach for a light switch in the bathroom only to discover that it was, always had been in another place entirely. We might reach for the air vent in our car where there was no air vent, a reflex left over from a previous present still active at a subcortical level. We might dream of people in places we had never seen as vividly as if we had seen them and actually known them. But we would not know what to make of this, assuming we took time to ponder it at all. One very pronounced impression would probably occur to us, to many of us, again and again, and always without explanation, the acute, absolute sensation that we had done once before what we were just about to do now, that we, so to speak, lived in a particular moment or situation previously. But in what sense could it be called previously, since only the present, not the past, was evidently involved? We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present Deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off, became actualized instead of the prior one, and that in fact, in literal fact, we are once more living this particular segment of linear time. A breaching, a tinkering, a change had been made, but not in our present, had been made in our past. Evidently such an alteration would have a peculiar effect on those persons involved. They would, so to speak, be moved back one square or several squares on the board game, which constitutes our reality. Conceivably, this could happen any number of times, affecting any number of people as alternative variables were reprogrammed. We would have to live out each reprogramming along the subsequent linear time axis, but to the programmer, whom we call God, to him the results of the programming would be apparent at once. We are within time, and he is not. I wish to add Lib. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. This too might account for the sensation people get of having lived past lives. They may well have, but not in the past. Previous lives, rather, in the present in perhaps an unending repeated and repeated present, like a great clock dial in which grand clock hands sweep out the same circumference forever, with all of us carried along unknowingly, yet dimly suspecting. <laughs>